in August 1771, Sir Watkin Williams Wynne, landowner, fitful politician and patron of the arts, set out from his seat at Winstead for a tour of North Wales, sketching, sightseeing and viewing both his considerable properties and his numerous tenants. He was accompanied by Paul Sandby, the celebrated artist, Thomas Appley, a neighbour, Captain Gascoigne, nine servants, 15 horses and a large cart for the baggage. The tour lasted 14 days and the company travelled over 220 miles. In 1777, Paul Soundby published a series of aquatins dedicated to his patron, entitled Twelve Views in North Wales, being part of a tour through that fertile and romantic country. It became an influential work. Altogether, Soundby published over 20 aquatins based on sketches made on the tour, bringing the beauties of North Wales to the attention of a wider public. The party set off on Wednesday, August the 21st, and returned home on Wednesday, September the 4th. Leaving Wednesday, they followed the Dee Valley to Bala, then to the coast via Dolgetlai, through Snowdonia to Carnarvon, to Bumaris and Conwy, and back home through Llanroost, St Asaph and Hollywell. The roads of North Wales in the 18th century were in a terrible state of disrepair but they managed to cover a distance of some 18 miles a day and stayed overnight, either with friends and allies of Sir Watkin or in inns. The sketches Sandby made on the tour enabled him to continue producing studio views of North Wales for another 30 years. With a change in artistic sensibilities and the eventual closure of the continent due to war, North Wales formerly regarded as the fag end of creation, became a newly fashionable tourist destination, a fertile and romantic country indeed. So Watkin and Paul Sandby had given a small impetus to the romantic re-evaluation of our landscapes. The next generation of artists, amongst whom Turner was surely the greatest, may have made more of the sublime in their work, but the affable and urbane Mr. Sandby laid the way for others to follow. Sandby had been to Winstead the previous summer, so the journey from Shrewsbury through Ellesmere and over Overton Bridge would have been familiar, and in his print he introduces us to one of the main characters in the little drama that was to follow, Sir Watkin himself driving his carriage up the hill to Winstead. The new bridge on the southern boundary of the park was the main approach from Oswestry, and in Sandby's second view the old mansion adorns the horizon. A little group in the foreground may well represent Sir Watkins' second wife, Lady Charlotte, and their first two children, who were born after the tour, but before the print was published. Homage from Sandby to his patron? The enormous park at Winstay still commands extensive views towards Chirk Castle. Chirk was the seat of the Middletons, chief political opponents of Sir Watkin. And although related by marriage, neither family wasted much time celebrating that fact. Sir Watkins' aversion to horse riding mattered little here, and his carriage could be driven round the several hundred acres of the home park to his heart's content. Sir Watkin had to conquer his equestrian aversions when the cavalcade finally set off on August the 21st, although whether or not he occasionally hitched a lift in the baggage cart we shall unfortunately never know. Off they headed over the new bridge towards the Llangoshlan Turnpike Road and new sights and sounds. The gentle clatter of the horses' hooves, the jingling of the harnesses and the singing of the birds were the background to their animated chatter as they proceeded towards Llangoshlan. Sandby's brilliant print, although willful in its composition, shows the rural tranquillity of the vale before Telford's and Navvies brought the modern world coursing through it. Not 
pausing in Llangollen, they crossed the ancient bridge and continued to Valley Cruces Abbey. Sandby and Sir Watkin had visited the ruins the previous year. As late as 1800, Sandby was still producing oil paintings based on sketches he made at this time. Built by the Cistercians in a spot far from the concourse of men, away from the temptations of the flesh, and where the silence was broken by the cry of the kestrel and the recitation of holy office. The scene has changed slightly. Passing through Corwen, Sir Watkin stayed with relatives at Reeg Hall, and the next day they all visited the waterfall at Cunwood Mill, paying the miller and his boy the enormous sum of six shillings and threepence for holding the horses whilst they sketched the falls. Sandby seems to have been particularly interested in the effects of falling water, and six of his views feature waterfalls. Cunwid is much the same as it ever was, and the newly restored mill is recognisably the descendant of Sandby's simple building. As they pushed further into the Vale of Edernion, they were in Welsh-speaking lands, and although proud of his ancestry and encouraging towards native culture, Sir Watkin was unable to speak the language himself. But judging from some of the curious English misspellings in the accounts, the servants must have been able to help him out in that matter. They followed the course of the river through Llandrithlo and Llanverfel, both of which were William's wind possessions, and paused for a while on the banks of the Dee at Bodwaney for a drawing session, although the mountain in the background of Sandby's view is in fact a Renig Vaur, and not Cadai Idris as he labelled it. The names must have been seriously confusing, and it's hardly surprising that he got mixed up when several years later he began to prepare his drawings for publication. At last, Bala was reached, Sandby must have been overwhelmed with the beauty of the lake, and he painted several large watercolours, charging Sir Watkin 21 guineas for one of them, as well as his prints. Sketch pad constantly in hand, he drew as he went, recording small details and large panoramas, characterful locals and slightly tipsy patrons. His productivity was extraordinary. Sir Watkin owned the lake and much of the land around it, as well as the fishing rights, and after a convivial and alcohol fueled night with some of his more prominent tenants in Ballatown, and after a morning trip on the lake, they picked up Owen Thomas, who was to be their guide all the way to Festiniog, and proceeded along the shores of the lake on their way to Dolgetlai. At Dolgeen, on the slopes of Cadaidris, the Iron Forge run by Abraham Darby was the main attraction, and Sandby produced one of his most memorable and noteworthy views of the grindings of early industry, whilst Sir Watkin presumably investigated the profitability of the enterprise with an eye to the developing industries around Ruaban, industries which were eventually to ruin his own landscapes. Judging from the hotel bill, that night in Dolgeshai was evidently a merry one, and the next day was taken at a slow and easy pace. The baggage cart was sent by a river to Barmouth, whilst the gentlemen ambled their way down the estuary. They stayed overnight at the Corsa Geddel Hotel, relaxing further and consuming large quantities of ice. The great castle at Harlech was to be their next destination, and Sir Watkin, who was in 1775 to become Lord Lieutenant of Merionshire, made sure that conspicuous charity was distributed to the poor of the place. 
Sanvi was one of the first artists to accurately record the appearance of the castle and he produced several works based on his sketches of it. Penguin Hall at Llanfestiniog, home of Owen Wynne, Sir Watkins' cousin, was to be their next refuge, and in his view of the fulling mills, Sandby hints at something which becomes an alarming feature of the accounts of the tour. The amount of alcohol consumed by the gentlemen on this part of the journey was by any standards amazing, and as they progressed, we may well wonder how any of them managed to stay upright in the saddle for long. But here are the simple pleasures of a late summer's afternoon. The fish are rising, the dog is yapping, and overindulgence is having its gentle revenge as Sir Watkin slowly nods off and quietly slithers down the bank towards the stream. Reaching the Trithmaur, the luggage cart was sent on the ferry to Penmorva and the easy road to Caernarvon, whilst the gentlemen continued through Llanfrothen towards Beth Gellert. This was the heart of the North Wales homelands, and Sandby's artistic sensibilities must have been assaulted by the sheer beauty of the place. We need to remember that the Trith Maur was still undammed and that the estuary was still water-filled and reflective of the mountains. Such beauty lost for the sake of Mr. Maddock's few salty acres. But now the ospreys have come back and global warming will probably flood it again. Nature will have her final say. Sandby's print of the Trith Maur is probably the first such view published. He was not to know that 20 years later, Turner, a one-time pupil, was to tramp over those same mountains and precisely capture their romantic grandeur. But Mr. Sandby, our delightful Mr. Sandby, led the way. The road to Beth Gellert took them through the Aberglaslin Pass, as famous then as it is now, and Sandby's view of it was the first of an avalanche of views. Postcards, tea towels, calendars, Beth Gellert's stuff and trade, a little bit of Wales pinned to every kitchen wall. had reached its midway point, most suitably in the mountains of Snowdonia. They reached Cardenarvon on the 28th and stayed for two nights at the King's Head, and judging from the bill, made free with both the kitchen and the cellar, but particularly with the cellar. There were celebrations of some kind going on in the town, and Sandby produced one of his more original and striking views of the castle at night, illuminated by bonfires at the Customs House and in Castle Square, and with the moon shining overhead and rockets exploding over the town. The next day, notwithstanding the state they may well have been in, they managed to mount their horses and went on a little excursion up the Llanberis Pass, took a trip across the lake by Dolbadon Castle, where they had lunch, and suitably recovered, paid some men to hold their horses and paid the guide to the mountain two shillings and sixpence, presumably with the intention of following him up it. We cannot be sure whether they actually climbed the mountain, so Watkin was not blessed with a mountain climbing physique or merely contented themselves with viewing that mighty slab of Snowdon, which was his. There was no easy way up in those blessed days. Had they ascended to the summit, and had the weather been merciful, Sir Watkin would have had the great pleasure of standing upon that lonely peak, and knowing that most of that which he surveyed, he also owned. 
Around the same time, Joseph Craddock, a Leicestershire landowner, recorded his impression of climbing to the top of the mountain. On the summit, which is a plain of about six yards in circumference, the air was perfectly mild and serene, and I could with pleasure contemplate the amazing map that was unfolded to my view. From hence may be distinctly seen the Wicklow Hills and Ireland, the Isle of Man, Cumberland, Lancashire, Cheshire, Shropshire, and part of Scotland, all the counties of North Wales, the Isle of Anglesey, rivers, plains, woods, rocks and mountains, six and twenty lakes, and two seas. Climbing Snowdon was a romantic, sublime and lonely undertaking in those innocent and trainless days, with not a rack and pinion in sight, not another walker, tourism uninvented, and certainly no fast means of descent. Leaving Carnarvon, they went to Bangor, where Lord Bartley sent his boats over from Bomaris to pick them up and take them across the straits for a night at a seat of Barons Hill. The servants were left overnight at Bangor, and Sir Watkins' agent paid the bell ringers of Bomaris a guinea to ring a suitably festive peal to welcome the young baronet. The view across the straits towards Snowdonia and the Carnarvon evidently impressed Sandby, and he reused it several times in later watercolours and paintings. Crossing back over the next day, they picked up the servants, found the one they had mislaid in Carnarvon, visited Bangor Cathedral, and resumed their journey passing over the dreaded headland of Penmaimar before reaching Conwy, where they spent two relaxing days. The tour now dwindled into something seriously cultural. The gentlemen seemed to have been unusually abstemious whilst staying at the Bull's Head, and a harpist was engaged to play for them, a poet engaged to recite, handbell ringers paid to entertain, and Sandby produced a remarkably complete set of views of the town and castle. Even Sir Watkin seems to have tried his hand at a little bit of gentlemanly sketching. Pressing on up the Conwy Valley by way of Clanroost, they arrived at the ancient bridge of Pontepire now submerged by Victorian Betusakoid, but then nakedly alone amongst the bare mountains. The noble restraint of the last few days was abandoned, and Sir Watkin seems to have reverted to his Festiniog behaviour. they visited the Swallow Falls. Here, even Sandby could hardly exaggerate the flow of water, and Sir Watkins' propensities for yapping dogs, noisome youths, a gentle bit of fishing, and a devoted study of viticulture surfaced once more. For Sir Watkin, this tour through his estates must have been particularly satisfying, 
But what must the tour have meant to Paul Sandby? Mountain scenery would have been familiar to him, but the countryside of North Wales, its variety, its beauty, and its good measure of the sublime must have come as a revelation to him. No longer could the infamous taunt of Bishop Burnett that the countryside resembled the fag end of creation be supported. The London artistic elite with their metropolitan prejudices had no inkling of the richness of the landscape of North Wales, but Sandby was to gently correct that, showing a land with gentle salmon streams, the sublimities of Snowdonia, romantic ruins and well-tended fields. Sandby had been known as the father of landscape painting. Perhaps he should also be known as the father of Welsh tourism. Artist and patron were well matched, the one at the summit of his creative output and the other experiencing the joy of his inheritance. From henceforward, North Wales was to become a place to be visited for its own sake, a place to be admired and a place in which to experience the thrill of the sublime. The scenic part of the tour was virtually over, although some surviving watercolours would seem to suggest that they visited Penmacno and Dolwith Ellen, where Sir Watkin owned property and mills. The return journey passed through St Asaph and Hollywell, and they arrived back at Wednesday on September the 4th. Sandby equipped with a bulging portfolio of sketches, Sir Watkin lighter in the purse by 117 pounds, seven shillings and sixpence, and all of them, in all probability, with the remains of a two-week hangover. It was a serious undertaking though, an artist at the height of his powers, a great Welsh landowner lately come into his own and convivial company turned a property owner's jaunt around his North Wales holdings into an event which had an artistic significance beyond its intent. Sandby had been handsomely paid for his participation in the tour and Sir Watkin was amply rewarded for his generosity when Sandby made the fulsome dedication of the Twelve Views in North Wales to his patron. Although Sandby had spent time in the Highlands as an army surveyor, the concentrated grandeur of the North Welsh mountains must have surprised him. In the vanguard of taste, if not style, his description of the landscape as fertile and romantic signalled the beginning of a profound change in attitude towards our native mountains. For Sir Watkin, the summer of 1771 must in retrospect have seemed one of the happiest moments in his short life. The weather seems to have been remarkably placid. He was with convivial company and seems to have been generally fated throughout the route of the tour. And the financial difficulties which clouded his later years were as yet unseen. He was not to know it, but there was less than half of his life left to him. However, for the moment, this tour of discovery through his homeland must have seemed one of those blessed moments which remain forever golden in the memory.